Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Science of SaaS Startups podcast. Today, I'm talking to Justin Beals. Justin is the CEO and co-founder of StrikeGraph. They're a seed-funded SaaS company, helping their customers to automate security audits and the, the compliance process. Justin, welcome. Thanks, Ben. Glad to join. No problem. So what, what I'd like to do is just start off by asking a, a few quick questions just to help the audience get to know you a, li a little bit. So the, the first one is, what, what is who was your uh, biggest role model as a kid? Ah, my biggest role model as a kid? Um, I, uh, I always was really interested in scientists and astronauts. Um, I, I, I don't think I had necessarily a name for one but um, uh, loved a wide variety of it. Everything from physics to astronomy uh, was uh, a material that was uh, in my house when I was a kid and I read a lot um, at, through to archeology span and history. Uh, and so I always thought I'd grow up well, I wanted to be an astronaut or a scientist of some sort. <laughs> yeah. You know, same for me as well. And actually, that was going to be my next question is, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be more mature, Ben. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I, I maybe um, uh, as, as I get older, what I'm most excited about is really empowering my teammates to achieve or working collaboratively as a team. I get a ton of joy out of that. And uh, being a service-oriented leader in my organization uh, definitely allows me to exercise. And so maybe what I most want to achieve is success with that model, uh, just to prove to others how powerful it can be, yeah. Yeah, okay. And what was the, the last gift that you gave somebody? Oh, um, well, uh, I tend to do a little bit of sailing here. I think it's a, a strong sport in the UK as much as it is in Seattle. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I, will, uh, I gave a friend a, a nice cruise for a week here in the San Juan Islands. And oh, okay, wow, really, that's a really generous experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we went out and, uh, and enjoyed the, the beautiful weather and long days, short nights, yeah. Yeah, okay, fantastic. And ha have you ever broken a bone? Yes, I've broken both my wrists. Uh, so the story around that is um, I am a, a hobbyist skateboarder and I broke a wrist, um, but I didn't want to admit it. Yeah, so I left it broken for a year until I broke the second wrist. And I went <laughs> to the doctor and I said, let's x-ray them both. And um, <laughs> apparently I had, yeah, I had just not been being good about going to the doctor when things were broken. <laughs> <laughs> And if you if you had a superpower to either be invisible or to fly, which would you choose? Um, I think uh, I would probably uh, choose the invisibility one. I'm always really curious how things operate without you know my influence, or uh, I'm trying to learn as much as I can. I think it would be amazing to be able to sit quietly <laughs> in some conversations, and, and said, especially really as a CEO, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, hopefully um, the audience now got a, a bit of a, a sense of you as a person. So if we jump into Strike Graph, so sure. this is um, an early stage business. You raised uh, a little under $4 million at, at the seed stage at the, um, at the end of last year. Did you want to uh, just start us with a, you know, an overview of the company and uh, what you're trying to do? Yeah, um, Strike Graph is focused on helping B2B companies uh, reduce their time to close and drive higher revenues through cybersecurity compliance. So I um, love working in startups. More traditionally, I am a chief technology officer and I ran into this problem as a CTO where our sales team was trying to close really important deals, uh, but sometimes it'd take 18 months, two years to get trust. And so StrikeGraph does its best as a solution uh, to automate or make efficient the acquisition of trust in a sales momentum, yeah. Okay, and I guess, you know, there are not many companies out there who aren't sharing data in some way. So exactly. is this an issue for like pretty much everybody? Yeah, what we say our marketplace is any B2B company that's sharing private or sensitive data is going to get hit with a cybersecurity audit request to win a deal I, I, if not immediately in the first two years of business, mm -hmm. um, easily. 
And the difference is that perhaps the buyer might spend nine months with you doing their own cybersecurity review, or you have this audit, the certificate that you can hand over to that buyer, and it communicates a level of trust through third-party independent assessment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and what does this market look like? I mean, there, there's so man, so much investment in the, the kind of security and, and GRC space. You know, uh, is it a very competitive market? Are there lots of vendors out there? Um, I think governance, risk and compliance has been around for quite a while, right? You know, financial audits in some form have been going on for centuries. And only now are we using those auditing techniques uh, for cybersecurity assessments. Um, I think that uh, what we do see is a, is a lot of new investment in the space because A, it's so critical a problem and it's, it's not going away on its own. You know, we, we have to build the, the security that we want in our own business community and that's what's happening here. Uh, and uh, the other thing that has um, really made it uh, much, much stronger in this moment is the fact that there are some internationally, if not nationally accepted standards that companies can measure themselves against. And that wasn't always the case that we had good standards to build a cybersecurity practice around. Um, and that's made it a lot, uh, A, easier to do because you have a common standard, but B, more required. So more and more buyers of technology are requiring that the companies they buy from meet these standards. So we definitely have competitors in the space. Um, we feel like we have a, an immense technological advantage with what we've built on our platform. It's very strong and it's very intelligent system, the way it works. And with StrikeGraph, what we're focused on is, is really trying to reduce the amount of consulting as much as possible that goes into the cybersecurity compliance journey and getting that audit accomplished so you can get that trust. Yeah, that was going to be one of my next questions, actually, was like the level of you know, software and service in, in kind of what you offer. So what, what kind of split is there, would you say? Yeah, I think we consider our solution a mix of both compliance and cybersecurity expertise and a platform. So the platform allows us to be really efficient with the expertise and also distribute some of that intelligence and expertise inside of the platform to everyone at a low cost for us, which allows us to keep cost low for our customers that are coming on board. At the same time, there's almost always a question about a firewall configuration, a penetration test uh, that needs to be accomplished, or uh, some uh, discussion about perhaps a, an HR policy or an access policy. And so we combine that on staff expertise along with a, a technology system that stores essentially your cybersecurity practice, your risks, your controls, the evidence that you collect to prove it and the audits you're trying to be measured against. So I know you mentioned earlier that this was an issue that you kind of ran into as a CTO in, in a previous company. And I guess you, you know, you must have looked at that time for, for other solutions you know, to, to this problem who are now kind of competitors of yours. So what, what did you feel they weren't doing, you know, that there was an opportunity for StrikeGraph? Yeah, I really think I came into the, the search for a solution and through a couple of different startups prior to StrikeGraph, I was searching for a solution to help implement better cybersecurity and, and kind of maintain a compliant practice. The struggle that I had, one was that there's a lot of uh, products that are marketed on compliance, but they don't solve the compliance problem. So certainly a cloud deployment solution will help your servers be more secure and that might contribute to co towards compliance, but it doesn't really wrap the whole, I need to get a SOC 2 audit. I want an ISO 27001 certificate as a solution. So that's one thing. It was hard to find a solution that was focused on the problem. The second thing is that the solutions that I did find looked like um, a resource library. You know, here's a list of policy templates or here's a list of uh, controls, but it didn't really fit the cybersecurity compliance practice to my business. And that's a real issue because one of two things are gonna happen. You're either gonna fail your audit because you don't have enough coverage or you're gonna overburden your cybersecurity practice and experience a breach. And so what's really important about the StrikeGraph system and what we saw is that we can build intelligent systems where 
by building an ontology of how risk controls and evidence are linked together. From any one perspective, you can rapidly scope your cybersecurity practice. And that means a better fitted cybersecurity practice that actually, you know, solves problems that you might be having. Fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Okay. And I, I heard you talking recently about kind of different types of customers that you engage with. And, you know, there, there are kind of larger organizations where you might be, you know, more talking to like the legal prep side of the business and their concerns about liability and then other kind of earlier stage companies where it's much more of a conversation around sales. I mean, I guess those two different types of companies, you know, require very different type of approaches in, in the way that you engage with them. Is it just like a, a twin prong approach to kind of building the company? Or do you see one of those as being more of a sweet spot and where you'll, you, you know, you'll grow the business over years? We're a much more powerful solution for those that are concerned with revenue on the yeah. revenue side. So, and certainly we tend to focus on standards that are, that are considered a revenue gatekeeper. So ISO 27001, especially in um, Europe and the UK is seen as a, if you don't have this certificate, we won't buy your services type of mm -hmm. situation. Whereas GDPR is a more liability based standard and so if you, for example, get caught not, you know, building your technology in compliance with GDPR or your solution, then you can be sued. And, and that's just a completely different type of compliance regime. Now, uh, we have some customers that are more focused on liability, but they tend to be bigger and they are investing a lot of money in it, but maybe the desperation isn't quite as strong. Yeah. <laughs> Those customers that have a contract on the line and they're not going to sign until security review is accomplished, they're really excited about StrikeCraft's, you know, we can accelerate um, them within just a month and a half, two months, they can have a SOC 2 audit accomplished and easily closing out that revenue that they wanted to get in the door. Yeah, okay. And I was reading about the, the machine learning platform that, that you've developed for, for security questionnaires, and I could almost like hear the sigh of relief for, for CTOs. Like, we're, we're, My we're sigh of relief, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> and, and I was just wondering, is that like a completely unique solution, do you think? Like, do you see anybody else doing that? I don't see anybody else doing that. Um, we, we do know of a couple of other uh, groups that are trying to tackle this problem, uh, but what we see in their methodology is not using AI um, for, for what it's capable of. And so I have a background in building AI driven products. Uh, in the past, I've, I've worked on it for a long time. Um, and that's, I think that's part of why we understand how to harness the technology and certainly at StriCraft, we think about AI software, not as a feature unto itself, but as a layer of the code that we need to add to what we're doing in almost every aspect of what we're working on. And I think most SaaS companies should think about AI in that way. It's not about, are we an AI company? It's about how is AI influencing my next tier of features that are coming out the door? Yeah. So um, what's, what's really critical that we have that um, none of our competitors have is a, a good information model for any organization's cybersecurity practice. And, and those risks that you're confronted with, they're your risks. The controls that you decide to implement are your controls. And the evidence that you gather is your evidence because you've configured your servers differently than the next organization. Because we build an ontology the relationships between the data matters immensely as we develop AI product. And that relationship model is kind of a meta scheme to the information that our security questionnaire AI uses. And honestly, this is just our first foray bin into what we can do with this ontology of information. And we're very excited about what follow on features are gonna come out with it. But I, as a CTO was tired of answering security questionnaires um, our customers submit the questionnaire they get and they receive back a report with the answers by their own controls of what they are doing to solve for each of those questions. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as you grow like your SDR team or whatever, you know, they probably won't find that like the most challenging sell you know, if they're, when they're talking to CTOs. Yeah. And I mean, as you grow, is this just purely a direct sales approach or, or do you see like a partner network in the future? 
Um, we started out in direct sales and uh, really, really happy with the progress. I mean, um, our velocity on the sales side has surprised me and I feel like I'm a pretty seasoned startup veteran in the SaaS space. And it's been really exciting how quickly adoptions, how successful our customers have been. All of our customers have met their compliance milestone audit dates that they were searching for. So we're really proud of that as well. Um, I think that uh, uh, we at Strikecraft see the business really, really growing quickly. Um, it's such a broad problem and, um, and we're helping solve these customers' revenue issues at the end of the day. And, and that's just an immediate ROI. They, they yeah. see it right away. Yeah. Yeah, you can sort of really build that business case quite quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in terms of like the market, are you tending to focus more on technology companies or or is there, you know, a kind of a sweet spot in a particular, you know, vertical or, you know, what, what's the approach there? Um, we didn't limit ourselves to specific verticals, although since we're, uh, you know, when you're a little young, you kind of go after the ones that tend to be the most fruitful, maybe you have the best yeah. network in. Um, we've had really strong responses from the following um, industries, health tech, uh, definitely, um, AI tech. We have a lot of AI companies that have adopted our platform um, as they're sharing a lot of data with their customers. Um, we have a lot of fintech uh, companies uh, that have joined up. And of course, fintech is not new to the compliance and security space with PCI DSS and some of the other regimes that they've dealt with for a little longer. Um, and we're seeing growth in our ed tech sector, which uh, certainly has a lot of data, shared data uh, between vendors. Every, you know, Ben, uh, I think the fringe companies that we get sometimes might be like a services organization or law firms, but we see them see using so much technology that they're getting asked to hit these cybersecurity compliance uh, requirements as well. Yeah, the, I mean, I think there's definitely a, you know, a gray line in some, in some of these corporate companies, like, they, as you say, they're using so much technology themselves, you know, they're, you know, they might not be a software company, but they, they might look like one to, to one of their customers. Yeah. So if we dig into um, startup life uh, a little bit, so StrikeGraph, um, as I said earlier, had a seed round in October 2020. And I believe that you founded the company a month before Corona hit, which we'll, we'll come to in a, a little while. But first, I, I just wanted to ask something slightly left field, because you have had a really entrepreneurial career. Like, as you mentioned, you, you've been involved in, in several startups previously. But when you were at college, you initially studied uh, liberal arts. And I was just curious, like what lessons you feel you took from that, which have kind of helped you, you know, along your path? Yeah. Um, I, I'm a theater major, Ben, is <laughs> what I went to college for. I, I actually started programming computers when I was a little kid, uh, and I just always kept up with it. But when I went to college, I wanted something very creative and, and kind of exciting and, and to meet a very diverse group of people. Um, I feel like theater was the best business degree I could have sat through. If you think really? about startups, yeah, you you know, with a, a production, you have to get a crazy cast of characters together, identify some script, get them all working towards a deadline with a singular kind of vision of the, the, the audience experience. You have to suffer a, a very transparent uh, feedback loop, both internally with your team and having an audience yeah, yeah. show up and watch you. Um, and then uh, there's a the financial aspect to it. You know, you want to uh, sell enough seats to put on the next production and, and sustain that business as well. And I think about startups the same way. I, I really enjoy the, the rhythm of getting a group of people into a collaborative mode, solving problems together, and doing that kind of re in, a, in a repeatable fashion. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I actually did data studies at A-level as well. Um, oh, and, yeah. and I definitely see, you know, a, a huge overlap in, in terms of, you know, how to build a business because there are so many different roles that you have to play like when, when you're building a company. And here I am, a podcaster, 20 years later. So, so maybe there's a seed sown like that very early, early on. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's a great degree. I, I think people undersell the well, there's there's a Gates Foundation study that shows that people with liberal arts degrees actually tend to earn more than an engineering degree over the fullness of their career because they have this kind of a skill set to consume and uh, integrate with with new environments and information. Yeah. So what will make you choose that then? Because you, you mentioned you were really into technology earlier. Did, was it always just a given for you that you were going to get into technology and you were thinking about other interests and how you could develop those? Or were you really into theatre as a kid? I was really into it and I, I thought I would uh, go for a career. I Right out of college, I worked for two years in film, um, just hauling cable around, really. It, it wasn't that exciting. I wasn't a director of photography or anything. <laughs> And then I considered uh, going and getting a master's in theater and spoke with some folks in the field and realized how long it would take uh, for me to really achieve and, and, and kind of contribute in the way I wanted. At the same time, a friend of mine was working for British Telecom and he understood that I knew quite a bit about modems and, and internet communications, which was nascent in 97, 98. And uh, I actually got a job with British Telecom. And to be honest with you, Ben, the pay was great. <laughs> I, I doubled my pay. I was a broke, you know, recently graduated college student. And then when I saw in 97, the startup momentum that was happening, I immediately said, hey, I want to work at startups. I want to uh, be a founder. And so very early on, I, I was trying and failing uh, a lot. Um, but but really trying to work in the in a founder space in, in, in a startup space, yeah. And in 2020, like, how, how did you find the, the fundraising scene when you were going out for that that seed round? Because um, I mean, there is so much investment going on at the moment. You know, what what, what did you find it? Um, so one of the things that even though I've done a lot of startups, I actually picked to incubate Strikegraph at Madrona Venture Labs in Seattle, Washington, a great incubator. I joined as an entrepreneur in residence. We spent six months testing the idea before we actually spun out in February of 2020. And so I, I find that um, these are such a collaborative team-based approach that honestly, the more people you can involve early on, the better for you, especially in technology. That, that might be different for other uh, types of startups. But for us, I, I'm perfectly comfortable really sharing the ownership and, and, and then sharing the work as well. I've had the other side. I've had sole ownerships and it's, it's painful and hard. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. No, you need those, um, those people to kind of bounce ideas off. Don't you? Exactly. Uh, and so once we spun out of the labs, one great thing about the incubator is they really help line you up for investors that might be interested in you. So I didn't feel like I had a lot of pitches that were worthless at all. Um, I felt like every pitch was very worthwhile. You're going to get every no until you get a yes. That's the one thing you got to get, tell yourself. You know, it's going to be 99 no's and one yes, and you're yeah. looking for the one yes. Um, but I thought every investor that I had a chat with had a lot of good insight and input. And still, I really enjoy talking with investors, especially during the pandemic. It's one of the best ways I have to connect with other startups and the challenges that they're facing and see where we're at. Yeah. Okay. So if we roll back to the very beginning uh, of Strike, strike graph so you mentioned that you had a previous company with an ml solution where compliance was was like becoming a real a real pain point yeah so how does that idea start brewing in your mind i mean does it just kind of build over several months before you even mention it to anyone or is there just one day when you think yes this is a real business and here we go i mean how does that happen uh i think the first uh, correctly so you're always looking for a tough problem you know, and, and, and especially in your own work, it's a great, great place to start. And uh, once I had a tough problem, it definitely brewed for me over a year and a half, I would say. So initially, you know, I ha at Koru, we had been hit with these issues for SOC 2 audits or ISO 27001. I knew it was a problem. When we sold Koru, it was time for me to look and see what type of problem might I like to work on next. Um, I was pitching StrikeGraph a little bit, uh, but another startup emerged and I, I tried something else for nine months and uh, rolled off of that project and came back to StrikeGraph. And so I was all the time pressure testing it and talking with people about it and seeing what they thought, yes. Yeah. 
And when you start building the company, like what, what are the key things that you're looking in for a co-founder, like beyond the, the skill set and the experience of what they've done before? You know, what, what are the is it motivation or compatibility, availability? You know, what, what are the things that you need there? Yeah, I think uh, I I had a hard time finding uh, the uh, my co-founder a little bit. I, I definitely tried on some different hats. Some of that is because compliance as a practice is a little new to me. I, I come from an end user perspective. I think that's really valuable in growing StrikeGraph, but I'm also not a, a, a deep compliance expert. Um, so uh, at first I thought maybe we needed to find a compliance expert, but the more I learned about cybersecurity compliance, the more I realized that we were our own expert on some level. And uh, really uh, what I found in Brian Barrow, my co-founder, is actually someone that fit my weaknesses. And so I think that's one really important thing to look for. I um, have held a CEO position in the past and done a lot of sales work, but I'm more comfortable as a chief technology officer or chief product officer. And so I could, in the very early days when there were three or five of us, you know, I can handle that aspect of the business. And Brian has a deep experience in enterprise sales. And so Brian could help us handle the revenue side. So I really think the best thing for founders to do is look at your strengths and then identify your weaknesses and try and go find a co-founder that fills in those weaknesses for you. Yeah, okay. So you started a company and then a few weeks later, uh, a once in a 100 year virus hits the world, forcing everybody into a, an unprecedented lockdown. I mean, what is going through your mind at that point? Is there any doubt around like the timing and the viability, or do you just trust the solution and, and forge ahead? I I think you you have to forge ahead as as a founder, as an entrepreneur, as someone that wants to build something that may not exist. A lot of times in in these situations, the the first response is generally to forge ahead. Although, please hold on to your ethics and you know, your, your values. If you can't meet those, then, then maybe you realize that the way is blocked and something must change. Yeah. Um, I, I had a, a company in 2007, 2008 um, that suffered through uh, the, the uh, recession here in mm -hmm. the States and it was really hard. We lost a lot of business. Uh, I founded that company in 2000 in the middle of the, the dot-com bus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so um, I feel like I've been through these a couple of times. And to be honest with you, you can't predict. And so this is what I would say to, especially just in a mental health perspective to other founders or people in this space. If you had a company in 2020 and it was a travel company and severely impacted by a global pandemic, you could not have predicted that. And <laughs> so you are confronted with something that you just kind of have to hang on and, and you you really can't beat yourself up. It's not your fault. Vice versa, sometimes you found a company and it's in its swing moment. And for us, we felt like compliance has been a big investment for people as they haven't been able to come into the office because that personal trust can't be built as easily. You need verified trust essentially. And so we're taking advantage of it. And I'll also tell folks that it, it, you know, the economy shifts down in, it really quickly. If you can right size to where the economy shifted down, then you can grow back with it. And so survival becomes a technique in these moments. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with being like, survival looks like this for us for a couple of years until things start coming back. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm mindful of, uh, of our time. So I, I've just got one, one last question for you. So what, what advice would you give to someone right at the beginning of their career who's really enthralled by the, the idea of being involved in, in the kind of the tech startup scene? You know, is it run for the hills or is it, you know, is there a kind of a, a good way to kind of build your career or, or enter into that, that industry? No, I, I think it's a tech startups are a great industry. A couple of things you need to accept is that you're not going to spend a 30 year career at Boeing at tech startups. Some will bust and uh, some will succeed and, and you need to just be willing to cope with those, be flexible with those changes. Um, one piece of advice I give um, people that are really interested in the startup scene and would like to uh, get engaged in it is to honestly keep your cost of living low. 
if you can keep your cost of living low, then there's a lot of startups that would love to bring you on because they're, they have limited resources and then you can grow with that organization. And over time, as you build a network of colleagues that you've worked with quite a bit, you'll just be invited as new organizations are being pulled together. Uh, I started recruiting our chief technology officer before we had ever spun out the company. Uh, we were- Because you just knew that's the person I need, yeah. That's right. I, I really wanted to work with them. Uh, they're very smart. And if this idea appealed for them, I wanted early on to keep them in the story and get them engaged, yeah. Yeah, okay, perfect. Well, it's been really great having you on, Justin. Thank you for joining us today. If um, if people want to discuss Stripe Graph with you, like what was the best way to get in touch? Yeah, there's a, an easy uh, demo uh, calendar on strikegraph.com. We're happy to share. You can always reach out to me over LinkedIn, Justin Beals. And then um, uh, uh, we have a live chat on the website. If you're just interested in learning more about what we do, feel free to come in and ask us a question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, uh, I really appreciate your time today and, you know, look forward to, to watching your growth uh, over the next couple of years. It's, uh, you know, definitely an exciting time for the company. Yeah, we're, we're really enlivened, Ben, and, and we love uh, that our customers are doing something incredibly ethical by building a better cybersecurity practice and monetizing that. It really feels good. Yeah, perfect message. Okay, thanks, Justin. Have a great day.